It's Friday, everyone. What do we do on Fridays here at the Hint Hive? That's right, we smash the patriarchy. Hello, ladies of the Hive. Welcome back to another buzzworthy episode of The Hint Hive, amplifying women's voices. I'm your fierce and fabulous host, Kelly Hint, queen bee of this hive, and today we're diving into a topic that's as old as time but still in desperate need of a makeover, gender stereotypes. Buckle up because we are about to shatter some glass ceilings and break free from those outdated norms. All right, my hive dwellers, let's get real. Gender stereotypes are like a bad 80s fashion trend that just won't die. But guess what? We are not living in the past. We're paving the way for a future where women can be anything and everything that they want to be. Before we unleash the hive, let's take a second to recognize some of the common gender stereotypes that have been holding our gender back. It's time to expose these myths and take back control of our lives. The first common gender stereotype that women have to deal with is the damsel in distress. The idea that women need to be rescued by a knight in shining armor will forever drive me batshit crazy. Newsflash, dude, I'm my own hero, thank you very much. If I need help with something, I will ask. I absolutely despise when I'm treated like I need a man in order to do something. Like on my social media profiles, I get countless messages from men telling me that I need their help to gain more followers. First of all, I don't give a rat's ass how many followers I have. I don't use social media to try and make money or anything like that. My people will eventually find me. And second of all, if I did want more followers, I'd either figure out how to increase my numbers myself or I would ask for assistance if I couldn't figure it out. I hate, hate, hate when a man assumes that I need their help. I am fully aware that I cannot do everything in life, but I am very good at clearly communicating my needs. I do not need a man to tell me what I need. And I will gladly teach every woman out there healthy communication so that she feels comfortable utilizing her assertive voice to communicate her needs also. Now, guys, don't be an asshole and get all defensive as I say this, because, for example, if I'm getting eaten by a bear and my face is in the bear's mouth and I can't communicate that I need help, okay, feel free to rescue me. I'd do the same for you. But you know what I'm talking about, so let's not nitpick here. Clearly, I could bitch about this for the entire podcast, but we have more ridiculousness to cover. Moving on. The bossy label. When strong, assertive women are called bossy or pushy, while their male counterparts are seen as leaders, it truly boils my blood. We are not bossy. We're the CEOs of our own damn lives. Thank you. And here's a hint for those who think women can't be strong and assertive without being labeled as bossy or aggressive. Newsflash, we're not asking for permission to take up space. We are claiming it, and we are doing it with style. Don't be hating if we're doing it better than you. The double standards have got to go. It's time to rewrite the script and embrace the fact that leadership knows no gender. Do I need to say it louder for those in the back? I hope not. And let's talk about the idea that women should only be soft and nurturing. Excuse me, but have you seen the powerhouse women out there making waves, breaking barriers, and conquering the world? We're not just soft. We are a force to be reckoned with. And when men believe that women should be gentle all the time, she often gets called a bitch when she is simply assertive. And when women get called a bitch constantly, eventually she is going to show you the difference between being assertive and being aggressive. Trust me. There will be no softness about her when she becomes angry. And another newsflash, women are allowed to be angry. And how about the beauty myth? The notion that a woman's worth is determined by her appearance. For all my sisters out there who have been made to feel that their worth is tied to their looks, let me drop a hint for you. 
We are more than just a pretty face. We are brains, ambition, passion, resilience, and unstoppable determination bundled up in a fabulous package. Also, with the beauty myth, there's a belief that women should look a certain way. Basically, she should not leave the house without a full face of makeup. This is bullshit. If I want to roll out of bed, throw a hat on, and run to the grocery store, keep your damn comments to yourself. I will also add that people, not just men, forget that humans don't all have to act the same. For example, when it comes to the beauty myth, there are some women who don't want to leave the house without putting a full face of makeup on. And guess what? That is just fine. You do you. I just push back on the expectation that we should all look like Barbie dolls if we're around others. Another fun stereotype that I repeatedly smash to smithereens is the fragile flower perception. The belief that women are delicate and can't handle the same challenges as men is downright freaking disgusting. We're not fragile. We are resilient warriors who can conquer anything. One of my favorite coffee mugs that I have is one with Ruth Bader Ginsburg's face on it, and it says, not fragile like a flower, fragile like a bomb. So yeah, if you're going to call me fragile, you better be prepared for an explosion. And on a side note, I'm going to take a moment to honor the late, great Ruth Bader Ginsburg because she deserves it. This woman fought tirelessly for women's rights. And however you feel about feminism, reproductive rights, etc., the great RBG fought for all of our rights. For example, she took on the United States military when fighting for women to be able to keep their unborn child while in service of the military. If it were not for her advocacy, women would be forced to either get an abortion or be discharged from the military if she became pregnant. Because this honorable Supreme Court justice believed in a woman's right to choose whether or not to birth a child. She didn't just fight for the right to have an abortion, and I think that's something that people are very unclear on at times. So I just wanted to set the record straight. Now, I have a lot of feelings related to women and babies, as I'm sure many of you listening can relate to. I'm a mom and a wife. I wanted to marry my husband and have babies with him, so I did. We had a discussion early on in our relationship about our beliefs on abortion. I told him that I was pro-choice, but that my personal choice was life. So he needed to understand that even if I was raped by another man and became pregnant, my intent would be to have the child. I wanted him to fully understand this so that he could make his choice as to whether or not he wanted a future with me. He clearly made the right choice, and I was lucky enough to never have to make a decision like that. However, that does not mean that I judge any woman who would make a different decision. Also, just because I am pro-choice does not mean that I judge a woman who is pro-birth. To be clear, I am not pro-abortion, I am pro-choice. There is a huge difference that often gets distorted by the media and the government and extremists. Now, I don't think any woman on this planet is excited about abortion. I simply believe that no one in this world gets to tell me what to do with my body, and I'm not going to tell anyone else what to do with theirs. And another point I'll make is that not everyone who claims to be pro-life is actually pro-life. They are pro-birth and don't care what happens to the child once it's out of the womb, what kind of suffering it will go through, etc. And again, this applies to some, not all, which is why I prefer to use the term pro-birth. And speaking of kids, the last stereotype that I'll go over today is the one-dimensional role. This is the expectation that women should only focus on one aspect of their lives, which is usually family or domestic responsibilities. Contrary to the patriarchal belief system, we are multitasking queens, juggling career, family, and everything in between. So do not try to limit us to one role. We've proven that we are far from one-dimensional creatures. And in the same vein, 
I've got to put it out there. Women were not put on this earth with the sole purpose to populate the planet. Thank you very much. We are not breeding stock. Some of us want kids. Some of us don't. Some of us can have kids. Some of us can't. Some of us are great moms and some of us suck. And some of us even have no interest in being intimate with a man. (gasps) Gasp. So stop pushing your damn values onto an entire gender. And ladies, stop doing it to each other. I can tell you that as a therapist and a coach, I have heard some horrific shit being said from one woman to another, and it needs to stop. We need to uplift each other, not tear each other down. Stop asking your sister, daughter, friend, co-worker when she is going to have a child. She may not want a little crotch goblin of her own. Or she may have tried and heartbreakingly been unable to conceive, carry, or birth a child. She may be dealing with wounds that you cannot see. So please, please stop being part of the problem. It is a woman's choice whether or not she wants a child, and it is no one's business but hers and her potential partners, so stay in your lane and leave her alone. And on that note, I'll share a personal story that I hope will help at least one of you ladies out there. I have a biological son and a daughter, both married, and... I say biological because I've also claimed one of my son's marine brothers as my own, but that's a totally different story. Anyway, my daughter does not want to have children, and I accept that 100%. I have zero issue with that. My son, however, has always wanted children. So naturally, when he was dating his then-girlfriend, they had discussions on their own about what their future would look like. Knowing that my son wanted children... I often joked around with my then future daughter-in-law about kids in one way or another. I talked about how beautiful they'd be. I'd talk about how I want grandbabies so badly and frequently teased her by asking when I'd have grandkids. I eventually realized that my joking was not okay and probably being taken very seriously. I won't lie. I want grandkids, so I won't pretend otherwise, but I never in a million years would want to make my son's partner feel that I was pressuring her to have kids. So I told her one day that I was sorry for the joking and I would not do it anymore. And so I don't. It's none of my damn business what happens in my child's marriage. The day that my son married my daughter-in-law was one of the happiest days of my life because I got to witness my son opening his heart fully and surrendering it to the most beautiful human inside and out who accepts him for exactly who he is. And for that, I am already eternally grateful to her. Anything else that may or may not come is just icing on an already fabulous cake. All right, back to the topic at hand. So we've covered some common stereotypes, but where the heck did they come from? Well, traditional gender roles have played a significant role in shaping societal expectations and common stereotypes. So now I'm going to go over 10 traditional gender roles that are very common that influence gender stereotypes. The first one is the breadwinner versus homemaker. This is the belief that men are primarily responsible for providing financial support, while women are expected to focus on homemaking and childcare. This is probably where that women as one dimensional stereotype originated, right? The next traditional gender role is emotional expression. This is the stereotype that men should be stoic and avoid showing vulnerability, while women are often encouraged to be emotionally expressive and nurturing. Hmm, kind of sounds like that stereotype of women having to be soft, gentle, fragile little flowers. Um, I'd like to note here also that men being placed in this role of having to be stoic and not showing vulnerability is very, very damaging to them. I tell you that from professional and personal experience. 
it is very unfortunate to pigeonhole men into the role of only being able to express anger. Guess what? Boys can cry and it's okay. And the third traditional gender role that we're all forced into um, involves occupational stereotypes. This is where um, people are assigned certain occupations based on gender, such as assuming women are better suited for caregiving roles and men for leadership or technical positions. Or uh, think of the healthcare setting. If a man and woman walk into your hospital room wearing the same set of scrubs, one a nurse and one a doctor, it is quite often assumed that the man is a doctor and the woman is a nurse. Or you walk into a boardroom and assume that the female sitting next to the male is the secretary, not the CEO. Or you walk into a lab and assume that the male is the scientist and the female is his assistant. You get the picture. And the fourth gender role is decision making. This is the idea that men are natural decision makers and leaders while women are expected to be more passive and follow their lead. I do not have nearly enough time in this episode to go off about this, so I will save that for another time. Trust me, I'll get there. It'll just happen naturally. And coming in at number five is color preferences. This is where we associate certain colors with specific genders, of course, like pink for girls and blue for boys. Um, And we are reinforcing these stereotypes from an early age. Literally just yesterday, my husband experienced a real life example of this. So he went um, for a teeth cleaning at the dentist. And when they went to give him his little goodie bag, they noticed that they only had pink toothbrushes left in their basket. So they apologized to him and said they'd go find a blue one. He looked at them and said, really, it it doesn't matter. I'll take a pink toothbrush. But they insisted and went off to find a blue toothbrush for him. Now, may I add, my husband used to drive a black and pink Camaro. You know, fun fact. He's very secure in his manhood and he does not buy into those gender stereotypes. And the next gender role that influences stereotypes is sports and physical abilities. This is the notion that men are naturally more athletic and physically capable, while women are seen as less competitive or weaker. Um, Just an aside, this is not about the clear biological differences between the sexes. We've all seen some women that are stronger and more athletic than some men. And I think we can agree that, yes, biologically, males typically are more predisposed to having more muscle mass than females. But again, that's not the point of the beliefs around gender roles. And coming in at number seven on the traditional gender role bingo, we have fashion choices. This is enforcing strict dress codes based on gender with expectations for women to wear dresses and men to wear suits or pants. For crying out loud, if Bob wants to wear a skirt, back off. If I had a big sweaty package between my legs, I would imagine that a skirt is a breath of fresh air. And for those of us who are attracted to men, um, hello, men in kilts, yummy. And coming in at number eight, we've got parental responsibilities. This is assuming that women are the primary caregivers and should handle most aspects of parenting from nurturing to discipline. Um, Quite often they're the ones that have to call in sick to their jobs if one of their kids are sick and that can cause problems. But thankfully, there are a lot more stay-at-home dads now, which I absolutely love to see. That's my favorite. Because I like anything that screws up stereotypes and gender roles. And now let's talk about traditional gender roles around expressing sexuality. Traditional gender roles often dictate expectations around sexual behavior, including the notion that men should be more assertive and women more passive, Um, We've also got, you know, this is very, very common, very cliche. If a man sleeps around, he's a stud. If a woman sleeps around, she's a slut. You know, there's just no need for any of that at all. If you're a woman and you want to be passive, that's fine. It is okay. But 
if you want to be more assertive, you can be. You are allowed to be. Find a partner who allows that and doesn't stifle it. And the last of the traditional gender roles we'll discuss is assertiveness versus submissiveness. This is the belief that men should be assertive, confident, and dominant, while women should be more submissive, accommodating, and nurturing. Again, I will be addressing this on a deeper level in the future because I have a lot to say about that too. Shocker, huh? So, what can we do to challenge these gender roles and stereotypes? Well, start by being unapologetically yourself. Break free from the molds that society tries to put us in. Speak up, speak out, and let the world know that you will not be confined by outdated expectations. The only gender roles you need to follow are the ones that you want to. If you want to be in a heterosexual relationship with a cisgender man and be a stay-at-home wife, do it. If you want to be the ultimate fighting champion, do it. Dress how you want to dress. Love who you want to love. Be who you want to be, whether it falls into a stereotype or not. One of the many keys to happiness is to be your true, genuine, authentic self, unapologetically. All right, my fierce hive queens, that's all the time we have for today. Remember, we are not here to fit into anyone else's idea of who we should be. We are here to redefine the game and set the world on fire. Thank you so much for joining me on another empowering episode of The Hint Hive, Amplifying Women's Voices. And if you know of any woman who could stand to be uplifted and empowered, please share this podcast with her. I want to reach as many women as I possibly can. Until next time, stay sassy, stay powerful, and keep buzzing because the world needs more of your unapologetic awesomeness. Hive out.